She knows how to fit into every conversation just by using her street smarts. She knows how to get past any question with a daring smile and a subtle lie. And if you ask her what she did this Sunday, she immediately responds with brunch, cleaning, you know, the usual. Shh, my little secret, I'm a Christian. She's likable, she's funny, she knows how to avoid every conversation about her faith. When you tell her your dad is in the hospital and not doing too well, she has every opportunity to say she'll pray for him, but all that comes out is, Oh, I'll be sure to keep him in my thoughts. Shh, my little secret. I'm a Christian. When she likes a new guy, she always leads with, Oh, I love dogs, books, and I, I, I'm, I'm a runner. She knows exactly how to fit in with the world. When people talk about getting wasted, she simply responds, Me too. Shh. My little secret. I'm a Christian. When politics come up, she knows exactly how to shy away from sharing her opinion. And when the perfect opportunity finally presents itself for her to share her faith, look, someone is asking about going back to church. Instead of saying anything, no, my little secret, I'm a Christian. My little secret, a Christian perfume. I'm glad you found that comical, but that is a reality in our world. Are you ashamed of Jesus? Are you ashamed of the one who loved you and gave himself for you? There are many different ways to show that shame. It's not necessarily uh, because you don't want to talk about it, but we'll cover some of those. But first, let's pray. Gracious Father, right now we want to ask you to forgive us for being ashamed of you. Because, Lord, it's, it's embarrassing for us to claim that we know you here amongst the others, believers. But when we go outside, we act like you don't exist. We act like we don't know you. We're with that type of person as we see you coming, we cross the street to do something else. Lord, we pray that you would change our hearts, change our minds, change the way we live so that those who see us will see you in us. Lord, we give you praise and we thank you. And we pray right now, Lord, that you would heal hearts as, as I say what I'm about to say. We pray, Father, if it offends some, Lord, we pray that you will help them become unoffended. But if not, we pray, Father, that it will cause a sorrowful repentance to bring them to come and to live for you. Lord, we thank you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Am I ashamed of Christ? Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. You can read along on the screen or use a tablet or your cell phone, however it is that you want to do it. But I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. It says, In calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will be also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Well, following Christ requires four things. We're going to cover those four. The first one is a decision 
has to be made. We're covering that in verse 34. It says, and he said to the crowd, if anyone will come after me, to come after him means to follow alongside of him. So he's asking you to make a decision. Are you going to live for me or are you going to live for the world? Are you going to follow me or are you going to follow the world? What is more important to you right now? Me or the things you can accumulate? Me or your friends? Me or your career? What's more important to you? So we have to make a decision on whom we're going to follow, on what's more important in our lives. The second is a denial is involved. He says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. To deny means I give up my rights. We have a lot of debate right now about everybody saying something about their rights. But for those of us who have received Jesus, the day that we received him, we gave up those rights. We have them no more because in Corinthians it says, you were bought with a price. You are not your own anymore. So you don't have any rights like the world does. Everything that we do is for him or should be for him. So denial is a heavy price. That means you have to give up something. Discipleship costs something. There's a price that that has to be paid. Look at our Lord. He paid a price for us. Do you think he deserves our allegiance? The second song we sang when it says, I'm sorry, that's how we should feel right now. Our nation is in shambles because we're secret Christians. We don't want to let anybody know where we stand. We don't want to let anybody know what we think or how we feel or who we trust. So we're unwilling to deny, but a denial must take place. Then another hard thing, a death is required. We're not talking about a physical death, but we're talking about a death to the things that are of the world. Now, when you look at a dead body, does it respond to you when you call to it? No. It doesn't react. It doesn't do anything. That's how we ought to be toward our own desires and our own agenda. We shouldn't have one. Each day it should be, Lord, your will be done, as we have often been taught to pray. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when his will is being done, our agenda is now out the window. We don't have a right to say, well, Lord, I don't want to do that because Lord and I don't, don't belong in the same sentence. So a death is required. Giving up. Where they be, I know it's a hard thing to, to give up a job, but if that's what the Lord is calling for, can you do it? When he called the first disciples, they were fishermen. That was their livelihood. But he told them, come follow me. So they left their nets, their livelihood. This is how they made their money. They left all of that to follow Jesus and trust him to provide for them. They didn't know where their next meal was coming from each day. They had the trust that God would touch the hearts of somebody else to feed them or to supply their needs. That's where we should be anyway, trusting God to supply our needs, not trusting in our own ability to do so. Yes, he does give us jobs. He does give us things that we enjoy doing, but those things should be secondary to our relationship with him. So we see a decision has to be made. A denial is involved. A death is required, and now a devotion is expected. Come follow me. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, I know it's been a long time, especially for me, for some of us who've had mass. But in some math equations, you have a this plus this equals that. So here, he says, to follow him and who's not ashamed of him and the gospel. So they go together. Jesus and the gospel go together. 
So if you're ashamed of one, you're going to be ashamed of the other. Then he says, what can a man give in return for his soul, his life? How important is your life? Is it important enough to surrender it to Christ and let him do with it as he chooses? Or is it not so important for you to give it to him because you have your own goals and agenda set? You have a certain amount of money that you want to make. You have a certain house that you want to get. You have a certain mate that you want to be with. Are those things more important than your allegiance to Christ? So whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed <clears throat> when he comes back. It just He's talking about the blessings the benefits, the benefits of knowing him. You can get to heaven, you're still saved, but you don't have anything to show for it when you're in eternity. It's you're just standing there bare. Everybody else has warehouses and truckloads of stuff, and you have a coffee cup. If you have anything. The value that we place on things shows where our hearts are. If we value Jesus... We're going to talk about him. We're going to brag about him. If we value anything else, that's what we're going to spend our time talking about, whether it be our family, children, work, sports, TV shows. Wherever we spend our, the most of our energy, it shows who we love most. Now, let me give you the definition of ashamed. Okay? Ashamed means to be embarrassed to show allegiance to or to deem less important or not as worthy as something or someone else. So when we don't speak up for Jesus, we're showing that he's not as important as what we're doing at that particular moment. How important is Jesus to you? Our actions speak louder than our words. We can say it all we want to. We say all the right things when we come here on Sundays. But Monday through Saturday, we live a different life. We don't want to tell people, hey, yes, I believe Jesus. I believe he's coming back. You need to be saved before he comes back. We don't want to tell them that. Why? Because sometimes that brings confrontation. But you just walk away from that. But don't be ashamed to tell people about Jesus. Now, can you imagine if the person who led you to Christ was ashamed of Jesus? Where would you be right now? You'd be hell bound just like anybody else because nobody took the time to share Christ with you. Don't be afraid of what somebody else will say when you're sticking up for Jesus. Remember what he went through for us. They took our Lord and they beat him, but that wasn't good enough. They took a cat of nine tails, which is a whip with glass and bone and rock on the end of it, and they beat him with it. 39 lashes, and they didn't, when they swung it, it stuck in his skin. And they didn't just walk over there and say, oh, Jesus, wait a minute, that's stuck on you. Let me pick that off for you, brother. No, they yanked it, so it took skin with it. He should have been dead, but he was showing you the power of God that they couldn't take his life until he was ready for it to be given. So with everything that he's gone through for us, He's asking a simple thing for us to do for him. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid to speak up. Now, there are some consequences, or there are some things that we, that cause us to be ashamed of Christ. And the first one is the fear of our circumstances. We look more of our circumstances than we do our our Savior. Then that'll be in uh, Numbers chapter 13 when God sent the spies out to spy out the land. God had already promised them, hey, this is what this land looks like. This is what I'm going to give you. I'm with you. You're going to conquer it. It's yours. So the spies went out. To spy out the land meant they went to explore the land. They went to explore the land. They went out, they saw everything, and they only took half of the promise of God. 
It is flowing with milk and honey, but the people are bigger than we are. We're, we're like grasshoppers in their eyes. And, and they had, God had already promised, I'm giving it to you. Just go look at what I'm giving you is what he told them point blank. Go look at what I'm about to give you. But they didn't believe that. They came back and were fearful. Even though they had seen him part the Red Sea, they had seen him put the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud in front and behind them. They had seen all of these things. Bring, they had seen the manna come down. They seen the water from the rock. But still, they wanted more. It wasn't enough for what he had done. So they look at their, we look at our circumstances more than in, instead of acting on the promises of God. When God gives us a promise, the God that of the universe cannot lie. So if he gives you his word, trust it. He's going to fulfill it. It may take a little longer than we expected because Abraham took 25 years for him to get that promised child. For David, he was promised as a teenager the throne, but it took 14 years for him to get that. But it doesn't matter how long, because in between that time that you're waiting, God is preparing you for what he called you to do. He doesn't do things instantly all the time. There are some things that are, need to be progressive. Sometimes we're the stubborn ones, and he's trying to work, and we won't let him. So we prolong things. If we let him have his way, we could probably get there quicker. <laughs> so if it's taking too long, look at yourself first and say, Lord, what am I doing wrong? How am I hindering you? But then there are other times where he's working behind the scenes on someone else to get them to do something. He's always preparing the way. He's always working. So trust that when he gives his word. The second thing that we see is when we are willing to make compromises. Look at Samson's life. His whole life was nothing but compromises, and we saw what happened to him. So when you're saying, well, this little bit of sin, is, I won't commit this sin because that's big. I'll do this one because it's small. Well, can you show me in Scriptures where God gives a description of sin, big, little, medium? Sin is sin in his eyes. So if you're willing to do the little things, they get bigger over time. They don't stay small because your appetite gets bigger. And the third thing is when we're not willing to get out of our comfort zone and make the necessary sacrifices. In John chapter 6, these disciples and a whole bunch of others had just seen Jesus feed 5,000 people. Now he's talking about him being the bread of life and how he is what they need. He goes on and talks about his death, his burial, and his resurrection to them. And then this is what happened. John 66, verse 6. You don't have to turn. I'm just going to read it to you. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They didn't want to do the hard thing. They didn't want to make the sacrifices that, it was going to, that were going to take to walk with him, to show their allegiance to him. They wanted it easy. I'm not going to lie. I like it when it's easy, too. Hard, I, I don't like pain, but sometimes you have to endure it. You know, I don't like conflict, but sometimes you have to endure it. But Jesus promises that when he told them, when you're giving up, when you're making that necessary sacrifice, in Mark 29, this is what he told his disciples. Mark 10, 29, he says, Truly I say to you, no one has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. You know, see how you threw that in at the end? With persecutions. So it's going to cost you something. In the age to come, eternal life. So now he's talking about you're going to get blessings while you're here when you obey me. It's going to cost you something, but you still get the blessing. But then when you get to heaven, you get the eternal blessings that came along with your obedience of what you did on earth. So here he is ready to reward you. 
His resources, we can't compare to them. We can't even imagine them. But he has a whole lot that he wants to give us. We just have to do that one little thing. But it's a hard little thing sometimes. We make it hard. For a little word, for a little, for a little word that makes our life difficult. Obey. We don't like that word because not, that means somebody else is in charge. Somebody else is in control. But did we not say earlier that we were not our own, that we were bought with a price? So he deserves control. He paid for it. He created us for his glory, so we don't have the right to tell him that we're not going to do something or that we don't want to do something. And parents, you know how that feels when your child tells you, ain't. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Or no. Well, I, I remember saying that a few times. And some of you in here know my mom. Uh, I didn't say it too often. <clears throat> but, but the Lord doesn't respond the way our earthly parents do. He's more gracious, more kind. And so we take it for granted even more. Why? Because we can get away with it. We think, well, he hasn't done anything right now, so it's okay. Or well, all I have to do is ask for forgiveness, and it's okay. Why do we do what we do when we obey Christ? In 1 Corinthians 9.23, it says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in the blessings. In other words, we obey Christ because we love him, but then he's giving us something. Here it is. He's telling us to do something, but he's doing it in us and through us because we, we can't do it. So he's doing it in us and through us. He's the one working. But because we're available he rewards us for doing what only he was doing in the first place. I mean, you can't lose with that. What are you ashamed of? What keeps you from sharing Christ at work, at home to a lost relative, at the grocery store? or anywhere that you have the opportunity? Are you embarrassed to let anybody know who you belong to? I'm going to leave you with this. Millions of believers will get together over the weekends and shout, cheer, scream, and show their passion for their team. <laughs> but they won't so much as lift their hands in worship and praise in the house of God to their Lord, the one they claim they love. Many will be able to tell you detail by detail everything that happened on their TV show, their favorite TV show, or what happened in a game, but they can't tell you what the pastor said last Sunday. Many will be able to sit back and give you all kinds of statistics. They can memorize those things. They can memorize the biography of their favorite celebrity, but they can't memorize Scripture. There's a problem with that. Are you ashamed of Jesus? Being up here is different. It's difficult. Sometimes we make it look easy, but behind the scenes it's not because there's always a battle. 
most people in their right minds wouldn't want this. <laughs> we, we, we drafting you next week, brother. <laughs> but most people in their right minds won't want this. Why? Because there's a lot of responsibility. All eyes are on you, so you can't hide. But for those who are behind the scenes, God gave you gifts and talents. He didn't give them so that you could be a hoarder. He gave them so that you become a master builder, building the kingdom of God. So some of you have the bricks that we need to help build something, but you're not there giving your gift or your talent to us. So we're waiting and people outside can't get to where they need to be because you are holding up your gift. Some of you are the transportation of our materials that we need, but you don't want to give your gifts or your talents to the house of God. So we're waiting, and the people outside are waiting. They have nowhere else to go, so they turn away. We chase them away because we won't do our job. Whatever your gifts are, whatever your talents are, God didn't give them to you for you. He gave them to you to build the kingdom. Now, there are consequences that come with that when you don't do it. You'll pay the price for it, and you'll wonder why it's happening. But if you don't want to put forth the effort and allow the Lord to use you, don't make excuses. It's easy to make excuses. But remember what I said. In Philippians 2.13, it says, It is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So, in other words, he's the one operating inside of you to carry out his plan. You just have to be available. Don't be Jonah and run away. Be a Paul and take the battle head on. Don't be ashamed of who you are. You are different. We're all different. We're different in a way that when the disciples were out preaching and teaching about Jesus, the people who were around them was the ones who gave them the name Christian. They didn't give it to themselves. Why did they get it? Because they were imitating Jesus. That's why they, they, so that was a derogatory name for them, those Christians, because they were doing what Jesus told them. So when he told them to come alongside me and follow me, he was saying, come alongside me and imitate me. Do what I'm doing. So the world saw that. And when they saw that, they said, they've been with that Jesus guy. So when your testimony from the outside, not in here, on the outside, can those people outside these walls say, hey, she's been with Jesus, or hey, he's been with Jesus? Or are they saying, hey, you know, here comes my buddy. We get to go do this together because they're down. Are we different outside of these walls? Are you ashamed of Jesus? <laughs>